where we're going to be discussing the production of quality feedstock from forest residues for emerging biomass conversion technologies. My name is Tom Waddell, and I work with Craig Rawlings at Forest Business Network. Our company is a partner in the Waste of Wisdom Project, and we're in charge of outreach. So we're happy to be your host today. Uh, if you'd like to ask questions of the presenters, uh, you can do so by clicking the Contact Us link at the very top of this web page that you're viewing the webinar on. You can submit your question in the forum, and then we'll get back to you just as quickly as possible. Uh, now, today we've got some great uh, topics and discussions. We're going to be addressing an overview of the Waste of Wisdom Project, sorting forest residues, comminution and feedstock quality, and belling forest residues for efficient handling and transportation. Now, our first presenter is Han Sep Han, Waste of Wisdom's lead project investigator, who will give us a brief overview of the project. Give me one second, I'm going to pass this on to Han. Uh, uh, thank you, Tom. <clears throat> My presentation uh, in this webinar uh, is to give you some ideas uh, about the background and the major goals of the uh, Waste Wisdom Project along uh, with uh, some key methodologies we are currently using uh, to accomplish our research objectives. Um, the, um, what you see in the slide, that's the first residues. So our uh, project, uh, uh, the, our project focuses on the utilization of the forest residues uh, left from uh, logging operations and the fuel reduction thinning or forest restoration. The picture you see in this slide shows the logging slash piled after completion of the logging operations and uh, typically uh, burned and wasted. So our goal is to utilize this type of the materials to produce a bioenergy or a bio-based bio product. Here's a, uh, uh, another big part of the logging slash showing the mix of the different sizes of the material, including a large diameter wood and chunks and uh, mixed with uh, a small diameter tops and limbs and branches. There's another whole tree uh, for the residues. This, uh, a whole small diameter whole tree uh, uh, residues uh, left from the fuel reduction thinning. Uh, this material also have not been uh, effectively utilized uh, much at all as well. Now, the, uh, the reason they are not so much utilized uh, with this kind of forest residue material, because those materials are very difficult to handle because they are not uniform in size uh, and shape and include a mix of different species. Bulk density is also very low. So, so for, for efficient handling and utilization, forest residues are commonly pre-processed in the wood through the process of grinding or chipping. Um, the, uh, if we look at the, uh, this, uh, let us, uh, picture on the slide, for the material of the limbs and chunks, and branches, uh, the uh, typically going through the grinding process to produce a hog fuel, which is uh, the uh, also the uh, in case of the uh, small diameter whole trees, a chipper can be used to the produce wood chips. Um, so under the current uh, uh, harvesting practice of the biomass operations, uh, ground uh, or chipped material are uh, typically hauled using a, a, a high weight the uh, uh, high weight chip band uh, to a uh, market uh, to to biomass uh, biomass market and uh, a biomass market uh, and the pay however is a very very low price for example the market value on hog fuel in northern california has been around uh, 40 to 50 dollars per bundry ton in the past 8 years but I have not seen, I have seen some of the, the, the price of hog fuel as low as $30 per bundry ton in Southern Oregon. However, the cost of the collection, the grinding or chipping, and hauling hog fuel or wood chips are often much higher than the values the market are willing to pay. So uh, people 
have been trying a lot of different innovations, uh, the innovations and the strategies to minimize the cost of this inudu uh, biomass operations to make it work. Uh, but uh, we have learned that very clearly that it is very, very difficult to minimize the cost of the uh, biomass operations, especially with uh, high transportation cost. Uh, now, I just want to briefly uh, give you some idea why trans uh, the biomass operations is so expensive, and especially with uh, uh, transportation. So what you see here, uh, an example of the fuel reduction thinning study we did in Arizona, uh, which explains very uh, well about why biomass operations are so expensive. This fuel reduction thinning operations include felling bunching using fellow buncher, and the whole tree skidding, and the loading, and the grinding. After that, uh, the material, uh, the, the grinded material hauled to the market for around 30 to 36 miles one-way distance. Now, if you look at the total cost as I was from stump to the market, including hauling, about $55.27 per point dry ton. That's for the uh, stump to the plant. Now, that's the total cost. But if you look at the uh, low right cost of the hauling, that is the uh, $26.11 per point dry ton which almost represents almost close to half of the total entire uh, stump to power plant cost, which is very, very typical in any type of the biomass, uh, uh, biomass operations. So um, this, uh, the uh, biomass hauling cost is so high because it's mainly uh, with uh, the uh, it's a low hauling speed on the forest road. So hauling this uh, the raw material without any further processing of the uh, to high densified or any kind of pre-processed material like a uh, briquettes, it's it's uh, it's in uh, you know in by nature it's so expensive to haul. Now so uh, so our approach was to integrate a biomass conversion technologies such as perfection, briquetting, and the gasification with the inward biomass operations. We are thinking that the uh, converting the raw feedstocks into torrified wood chips, briquettes, and uh, or biochar near the forest or in the wood and hauling them to markets, uh, markets will fundamentally address this high cost of structure of current efforts of utilizing forest residues. So we are looking at inward conversion, uh, biomass conversion, uh, which in integrated with uh, uh, current biomass operations. By doing that, we are expecting two major benefits. Number one, that is, we can effectively uh, significantly decrease the transportation and the handling cost. Because now we are dealing with uh, very low or no moisture content when you produce biochar. And we are you're talking about a very highly compacted, high density material when you produce briquettes. So with that kind of a, a pre-processing of the material uh, uh, in the world, we can effectively significantly decrease of the hauling cost. Second benefits we are looking at, that is the uh, increase of the product value. We can uh, very in, uh, nicely add value to the uh, uh, feedstock material by converting the biochar uh, briquettes and the torrified wood chips. So in any case, in combination of these two benefits would uh, significantly address the, the current challenges of the poor economics in the utilization of forest residues. So uh, with that uh, idea in mind, our waste wisdom project uh, uh, is to utilize forest residues that are currently underutilized or wasted for production of the bioenergy or uh, bio-based products. So we expect that uh, there will be a significant benefits in social economic values and the environmental protection through efficient utilization of forest residues. That's kind of a general ideas and goal of our project. Uh, to accomplish this uh, research objective, we have three task groups in our team. Uh, feedstock development team uh, focuses on the uh, uh, 
the, uh, their effort on the production of the quality uh, feedstock from first residues. And the second group of the research team members are developing a three uh, biomass conversion technologies, uh, which include gasification, perfection, and briquettes, which will be operated near the forest or in the wood. And the third group will be a performing analysis in economic environmental benefits from the utilization of forest residues. So uh, uh, with, uh, as Tom mentioned uh, at the beginning of the, this webinar, uh, we are going to talk about the uh, production of the quality feedstocks in this, uh, uh, in this uh, webinar. So with that, uh, I, uh, that conclude uh, my presentation on this webinar. Now I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. O'Neill Kizel, who has been speaking about, who will be speaking about the uh, sorting and uh, sorting of forest residue during the timber operation. O'Neill. I am O'Neill Raj Kizel, Assistant Professor of Forest Operation at the University of Maine. I would first like to thank you all for attending this talk. My part of the talk is titled Forest Residues, Sorting and Arranging for Production of feed Feedstock Quality. As Dr. Hahn has already mentioned, our study uh, focuses on the creating feed <coughs> feedstock for biomass conversion technologies such as torrefaction, and biochar and gasification. However, these technologies require high quality feedstock when compared to the conventional feedstocks for energy plants in terms of uniform size distribution, lower moisture content, and lower soil particulate contamination. From the piles which you are seeing on your right of the screen, these cannot be achieved. With the current practice of piling the biomass together, it is not possible to attain these targets, especially after having the forest residues piled together, the only option for combination becomes grinding, which would not provide uniform size distribution. To get a uniform size distribution, these materials will have to be chipped rather than grinded. In order to achieve our targets to, of uniform size distribution, we separated the treetops from the slash materials, which predominantly consisted of limbs, branches, foliage, and other and chunks. The treetops were again and sorted into different piles. The goal of this study was to find the cost associated with varying intensity of processing treetops and sorting them into different piles. We also identified the major factors that affected the overall cost and productivity of the operation. At last, we estimated the moisture content reduction in forest residue through different arrangement patterns. So, the processing was done at the landing with a dangle head processor. As a part of this study, three treatments were carried out. The first one was business as usual, where all the forest residues generated from the processing was gathered into a single pile. This was taken as the control. For the second treatment, namely moderate sorting, the processed treetops were sorted into two different piles based on species. In this case, it was hardwood and conifers. And the slash materials, which consisted of limbs, branches, and foliage were piled into a different pile. The last treatment was intensive sorting. This is the one which is being shown in the picture. This included two piles similar to that of moderate sorting, which was of treetops and slash material. Furthermore, there were two additional piles of unprocessed treetops. In this case, the treetops were not delimbed. Coming to the moisture content treatment, four different patterns were constructed. The first one was TP. The second one was processor pile. Number three is crisscross, and number four is scattered. Looking into the first one, that's TPs, the conventional way of piling forest residue in the region, 
These piles composed of all the forest residues, including treetops, trunks, branches, broken logs, and small diameter trees. These materials could only be grinded and could not be chipped. Coming to pro no, picture number two, which is the processor piles. These were processed treetops nicely arranged with butt ends together. They composed of delimbed processed uh, treetops and occasionally broken logs and small diameter trees were also included. Number three, which is crisscross, this pile was designed exclusively for the PERP study. A loader constructed these piles with the intention of maximizing airflow. The platforms were also raised from the ground to minimize water stagnation during a rainstorm event. Number four, which is scattered, these were forest residues left at the harvest units and not brought to the landing during the primary transportation, which means transporting from the stump to the landing. So what did we do? To estimate the productivity, the volume of the stand was initially uh, cruised, and later the scale tickets were collected from, timber from the timber company. We also monitored the moisture and the machine operation in the field, later used standardized comparison to assess the cost and productivity of the operation. Sensitivity analysis was performed to identify the effects of key variables. Coming to the moisture content, transects were created over the piles and wood discs were taken from them. These discs were later oven dried at 103 degrees Celsius. The weather data, such as temperature, precipitation, and relative humidity were collected from the nearby weather station. So what results did we get? The total cost of operation ranged between 97 to $106 per MBF. Now this is looking into felling to loading of the saw logs. The additional time to process and saw the treetops only increased around $10 per MBF from non-sorting to intensive sorting. Again, as we expected, 30 to 60 percentage of the total cost was still associated with the primary transportation. In this case, shovel logging. Processing biomass only constituted around 20% of the total cost. Again, the processor was the only component which showed a clear trend of increment from non-sorting to intensive sorting. Looking at the moisture content reduction, the reduction was from around 51%. This is from the fresh cut to around 12 percentage after one year of storage. I would like to bring to your attention that this chart only shows the reduction in moisture content after the piles were created. The moisture content loss, losses were highest during the initial part of the storage. Scattered treatment was the only one which significantly differed from the rest of the arrangement patterns. Again, this difference was only found till the first 10 months after which there were no difference between the, the treatments. So what does this have, or what are the impacts of this on management? The increase in cost due to processing and sorting was estimated to be around $500 per acre. However, this is also <coughs> associated with a saving in <coughs> site preparation costs, which can range in the value of $300 to $800 per acre. By doing so, the sorted crops can be chipped and Joel, the next speaker, will be explaining about the higher feed, feedstock quality obtained by this. Additionally, these materials can also be marketed as dowel and post pole. Once more, let me thank you all for attending the se seminar. I would like I would be happy to answer any questions you may have during the Q&A session, but for now, let me introduce the next speaker, Mr. Joel Bison, who is a graduate student at Humboldt State University and the project coordinator for the entire Birdie team. Joel? Hi, thanks, Sunil. And thanks to everyone for viewing this webinar. 
Today I'm pleased to present some of the work I have been doing towards developing feedstocks for the various biomass conversion technologies that our project is investigating. So let me begin with why it's important for us to understand feedstock quality. Well, there are two main reasons I can share. One is so that we can quantify specific characteristics when we are comparing ground material generated from slash and chips generated from sorted residues. As we learned from Anil's presentation, sorting stem wood from other residues such as limbs and chunks during a timber harvest does come at a cost. So any improvement in the quality of the feedstock uh, would need to be justified. The second reason is that the results will provide our biomass conversion technology research team with a solid understanding of what we can be extracting from these forest residues. To be more specific, I wanted to quantify the distribution of particle sizes that were created, the moisture content of that material, and the ash content, as well as bulk density of the various feedstocks. Initial tests were done by our biomass conversion research team to determine how the different BCTs performed with different feedstocks. The table you see above illustrates the current range of specifications each um, BCT requires. We're looking at particle size, moisture content, and ash content specifically. From their test, the BCT research team identified that particle size and moisture content were two key factors that influenced the performance of their machines. In some cases, oversized particles created jams in the rotary airlocks on the torrefaction machine. Feedstocks with higher moisture content increased the residence time in the torrefaction machine, which resulted in reducing its productivity. Or in the case of the briquetter, high moisture content resulted in poor quality briquettes that would expand or break apart later. Uh, I want to be clear that meeting these requirements of the BCTs was not necessarily my objective of the study, but rather it was to inform the engineering process of some of the constraints they face while considering their feedstock needs. So to set up the study, I coordinated with uh, Dr. Kiza on his research and had the processor that you saw in his presentation uh, create four different material types. On the left, you'll see in box one, this is a photo of processed or delimbed conifer stems and tops. Notice the amount of bark that has been stripped off during the processing. Box two shows a pile of processed hardwood which was almost exclusively tan oak in this study. In box three in the upper right, you can see unprocessed conifer stems and tops with their branches and foliage still attached. And in box four, we have unprocessed hardwood stems. I included a diagram of the experimental design to give you kind of a better idea of how we organized this study. The four main material types were collected from three individual harvest units. There's unit one, unit two, and unit three. They were chipped and sampled separately to capture variation between the three units and between the material types. This was also true for the slash material collected from the three units, but instead was put through a grinder and samples were collected. So before sending the material through the chipper or grinder, each material type was characterized based on volume and bark cover. From this, we determined that processing significantly reduced the amount of bark cover on an average stem, as we expected. And that processed material were almost double in volume compared to unprocessed. And this was mainly due to the operator's preference to not process all the way out on the stem as this would uh, inevitably lead him to dropping it as it snapped, as it got to the very thin top of the tree. 
So the different material types are then commuted with an 875 horsepower 30 inch disc chipper. Samples of each material type were systematically collected as they were fed into the chipper. In total, 156 samples were taken from just over 200 bone dry tons of chips, which was collected in over a three day period. And kind of an interesting side story, before we started the data collection, the contractor took me around and showed me dents in the aluminum at the far end of the trailer from the flying chips and chunks. Um, so needless to say, I was a little nervous when I first held that collection tube. So as you saw in the experimental design, we also ground mixed slash, uh, which is pictured in the left. These samples were collected to provide us with a comparison between chipped and ground material from the same harvests. The only difference would be that they were not sorted or processed. When we were finished, um, all the samples were analyzed in a lab using standard methods to provide data on particle size, uh, moisture, density, and ash. So let's get to the results of all that work. This table is a summary showing the average feedstock quality values for each material type. The distribution of chip sizes among the different material types were rather uniform. We only noticed a significant difference in the average length of an unprocessed hardwood chip. What is very noticeable though is the difference in the average particle size between chips and ground material, almost double more than double in size. Similarly, similarly this difference um, can be seen in the amount of ash, moisture content, and bulk density. And I should mention that our initial hypothesis was that bulk density and moisture content would have been influenced by processing, but uh, the evidence failed to support this. I'd like to take a second to talk about the distribution of particle size between the different material types. Uh, on this graph, we see seven size classes along the horizontal axis, and the percentage of material within that size class on the vertical on the left. The conifers um, are in the green shades, and the hardwoods are in the brown. The differences are subtle, but would be very informative to our BCT uh, crew. We could take a look at this a little differently by aggregating the particles into three classes instead of seven. These three classes are based on some target particle size requirements that uh, our BCT team were interested in. And this graph shows a bit more contrast between the different material types, and especially if you're comparing it to the slash findings. If you look at the ash content, there was a significant reduction between processed and unprocessed conifer. So the, the act of processing reduced it almost by 50% um, from, from, our, what we saw from, from what we saw from our results. However, this was not observed in the hardwood samples, and we're looking into that a little bit more. The difference in ash content between chipped and ground materials is also very significant. So in conclusion, sorting out stem wood during the timber harvest can facilitate chipping over grinding. Chipping will provide a much more homogeneous particle size that uh, may be more acceptable to biomass conversion technologies. Sorting material produced a feedstock lower in ash content compared to ground slash. And lastly, through sorting and chipping, we were able to see um, a big improvement in the feedstock quality between chips and grindings, and a more subtle improvement between the four chip material types. These improvements provide evidence that may justify the additional cost to sort. And with that, I'd like to thank you again for viewing. I welcome any questions or comments you have. You can address them at to the contact uh, information you see here or a link provided. At this time, 
I'd like to introduce Jim Dooley, who is the Chief Technology Officer at Forest Concepts and project partner with the Feedstock Development Team. And I'll hand it over to Jim. Thank you, Joel. Thank you, Tom, for coordinating this. Uh, as Joel said, I'm with Forest Concepts. Our role in the Waste of Wisdom project is to evaluate the potential for bailing the branches and tops into large rectangular bales that are much like hay bales you're all familiar with. We're developing conceptual specifications, conducting limited field data collection using our engineering prototype biomass baler, and modeling the expected performance of conventional commercial baler types. This presentation discusses how we used a stakeholder-driven process called appreciative design to establish bale sizes and top-level baler configurations. I'd like to start by talking a little bit about our approach to engineering. Most people believe that engineering is a purely technical discipline that brings together facts, data, and science to design the one right solution to a problem. Our company subscribes to a different model that includes strong social and ecological considerations inside the design space. As you just heard from Anil and Joel, the Humboldt State University team studied best methods to match various fractions of logging slash piles with potential value added uses. The outcome was that piles are sorted or merchandise such that poles and chunks are removed for hauling decentralized chipping sites for conversion to pallets, fuel briquettes, and biochar. That leaves the remaining pile of branches and treetops as shown in the photo next to our engineering prototype baler. That material is mostly a tangle of branches that would have a transport density of less than five pounds per cubic foot if loaded into dump trailers or hook lift containers. It's also very difficult to grind and process through grinders as a loose material. The low density means the cost of hauling is even higher than you saw earlier or the, based on the economic value of the payload. Consequently, forest landowners typically leave the branch piles and burn them in place. Bailing of branch, branches, tops, and brush into high density rectangular bales has the potential to reduce the cost of transport on conventional tarp flatbed trucks to off-forest processing sites. In our earlier work with urban biomass at Forest Concepts, we only sought to make bales over about 15 to 20 pounds per cubic foot density to maximize trucking payloads on public highways while minimizing the engine horsepower for balers that could keep up with an arborist or a vegetation management crew. The waste of wisdom forestry situation seems to reward much higher bale densities. In general, higher density is better, even though it takes increasing amounts of energy to make incrementally higher density bales. The payback for investing in high density comes from smaller bale yards, higher payloads for inwoods hauling, and more efficient grinding by fully utilizing the power available in industrial and mobile grinders. Let's move on to how we design the baler and the data that we've used. The design process starts with identifying stakeholders and constraint owners. Stakeholders are those who are affected or who care about the outcome of the project. Um, and we identify people by brainstorming, by having conversation. And the key question is who cares, who's affected by what we're planning to do, and what's important to them. This abbreviated table shows the scope of our effort to be inclusive to bring stakeholders of various types into the design space. We trust that many of you listening Find yourselves on this list, and if not, let us know. What's important to them? As we aggregate the comments we heard from various stakeholders and audiences, at a high level, we can look at the comments, desires, wants, needs, and constraints, 
and use an affinity process to develop sets of consensus objectives and constraints. As with most engineering projects, safety and cost top the list. For almost everyone, safer is better, lower capital and operating costs are better. But we start to diverge when we aggregated ideas about bale size, weight, and other factors. Most aggregated into two camps, those who wanted bigger, as heavy as practical bales, and those who wanted bales that could be handled by their skid steer loaders, small grinders for just-in-time processing, and those that had lowest greenhouse gas emission scores in their life cycle analysis. Similarly, desired productivity sorted into those who wanted to replace 1,000 horsepower grinders with Inwoods balers, and those wanted agile, lightweight equipment to run the forest like an ant colony to collect random piles. As we digested all this information, it was clear that one size will not be acceptable to all, or even to most of the potential users. Thus, we committed to conceptual specification of two baler types to respond to the two clearly different customer segments. This slide gives an idea of the high-level guidance to design engineers that frame each baler type. As they read the descriptions, designers can begin to form mental models of what each baler might look like as to size, power, and configuration. The stakeholder identification and constraint setting process yielded additional insights to guide designers of commercially relevant forestry balers. Among the high-level objectives and constraints are those listed on this slide. We heard that elimination of chainsaw operators and ground crew was a big deal to many stakeholders of both large and small balers for safety and cost reasons. We also heard that the core baling system should be modular to enable being mounted on almost any trailer or prime mover to meet the personal preferences of various contractors or operators. The next two slides begin to detail the two baler types. We call the smaller baler the forest biomass utility baler and the large baler the forest biomass large baler. I'm sure marketing people at our commercialization partner will come up with much catchier names. The forest biomass utility baler is in, intended to operate a little bit like an ant colony, so that across a landscape there are many of these operating together, and then the bales being collected from wherever they're working and brought to central sites. But one of the things we learned from stakeholders was that they held many different opinions about the prime mover or running gear for forestry balers of this type. Some were satisfied with our current on-road trailer concept. Others wanted a high flotation log trailer running gear. Quite a few stated that they would mount a baler onto an old model log forwarder or an all-wheel drive truck chassis or any other piece of equipment they had. The diversity of wants suggests that our current baler design, which is a bolt-on module, is on the right track. The rendering on this slide is of a baler module mounted on a straight trailer having a pencil hitch and loader. This could be pulled by a one-ton all-wheel drive truck, farm tractor, or lightweight forestry skidder. The bale size for the forest, forest utility baler was established to be easily lifted by small log loaders, skid steer loaders with forks, and other small equipment. The bale dimensions were constrained to feed into the smallest models of Peterson horizontal grinders expected to be used by community-based centralized biomass conversion firms. Peterson is another cooperator in the Waste to Wisdom project, so we featured their grinding capabilities in our engineering. At the other end of the scale, the forest biomass large baler was intended to focus on mobility, extremely high production rates, and serve as a substitution for in-woods grinding operation. This would allow that material to be hauled on flatbed trucks out of the woods uh, to grinding at an industrial or central site. The rendering on this slide looks a bit like a shortened horizontal grinder on tracks for good reason. Mobile grinders have evolved over the years in response to market demand and continuous operator feedback. Our interviews with numerous forest operations contractors and biomass processors led us to a configuration that is track-mounted, 
Remote operated from a traco loader, just like grinders are today, in very high productivity. Bales can be forwarded and hauled using conventional flatbed trucks and trailers that are much lower cost and more amenable for use on forest roads. Bale size is constrained mostly by the end feet of the largest Peterson horizontal grinders and by a need to fit within legal highway truck regulations. In general, bales from this baler are targeted to be about twice the weight as bales of the forest utility baler. This data slide shows our current thinking on core product families for urban greenwood and forest biomass balers that have a chance to become cost effective and commercially relevant. This table provides basic data for the forest concepts engineering prototype as it exists today after the Waste of Wisdom project funded improvements, the conceptual specification for commercial urban balers, and our new conceptual specifications for the two forest biomass balers. These data are currently being used by the logistics, central processing site, and life cycle analysis teams within Waste of Wisdom to conduct their studies. It's important to note that the capital cost line is only for one baler and does not include the supporting equipment such as truck, track loaders, bale handlers, and other equipment that's a necessary part of the complete logistics system. With that, I'd like to thank you uh, for your time and attention and interest in this topic. At this point, I will pass the baton back to Tom Waddell for closing comments. Thank you, Jim, uh, and thank you, Han, Anil, Joel, and Jim, for all your great presentations. And we appreciate you all out there uh, listening to uh, and watching our webinar. If you all would like to, if you have any questions for the presenters, you've, you've seen their contact information on the various slides throughout the presentations, or you can contact them that way, or you can uh, click the Contact Us link at the top of the web page and submit your questions in the form, and we'll get back to you just as quickly as possible. If you want to see more webinars from the Waste of Wisdom Project, you can go to our webinars page at waste2wisdom.com forward slash webinars. Thanks again for your interest in the Waste of Wisdom Project, and we'll see you at the next webinar.